a professor in Bible college that he, in one of his books, he listed the 100 greatest chapters in the Bible. Now, when you undertake to do something like that, something has to be left out. But this chapter was not. It's one of the great chapters of our Bible. All of our Bible is great. But some are elevated above others to give us help and to point us in a clear manner to the Lord Jesus. And I'm glad that this one is in our Bible. We celebrate Easter and also it was the beginning uh, time of the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. And we call it the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. And uh, both are proper because when we sit down to supper, we usually is a time of fellowship and communion one with another. And he, when He instituted the Lord's Supper, He was observing the Passover. Meaning there was more on the table than just the cup and the unleavened bread. There was a lamb that had been slain. There were bitter herbs that was placed on that lamb as it was cooked. But could I say, we no longer have to, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll get there again. Uh, I want to say this before I forget it. That we, we no longer have a lamb on the table. We have a lamb in our heart. The Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. The Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away our sins. He is our sacrifice. Paul said in Corinthians that He is our Passover. He is our sacrifice. We have a portion of what is called the church world. And it is not the true church. But they, uh, when they take communion, they are saying they uh, are crucifying Christ afresh. Could I say there's no need for that? He died once and forever. And sufficient for you and I. So we no longer have a lamb on the table. We got the Lord on the table. We are he is, these things are not him, these things represent him, typify him, show forth him. Because when we partake of this particular time, we are remembering him. This do in remembrance of me. It's a memorial. Memorial is not all not the actual thing that happened. A memorial is remembering the thing that happened. We do not need a lamb because he is the lamb. Matter of fact, there's three three things that were mentioned, or actually four, but there's three things that are mentioned as we travel through Scripture. In Genesis 22 and verse number seven, uh, Isaac. Asked his father, where is the lamb? It's a good question. And of course it's typified all the way through the Old Testament. But that question is not answered. Until John chapter 1 and verse number 29. And John who is preaching on the, on the river bank. He said, behold the lamb of God. That taketh away the sin of the world. There's the Lamb. But then we get in heaven. In uh, Revelation chapter 5, we've been through this and we preach preaching through the book of the Revelation, verses 12 through 14. Worthy is the Lamb. We're going to sing a song about Him. 
and magnify Him. We make much of the Lamb of God because He is much. Without Him, we would not even be here this evening. We would be in another place, somewhere else. Jesus has changed this whole world by His birth, by His ultimate death, and sent power by His resurrection. We're living, as Brother Gary said a moment ago, we're living by the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That same that word, dynam- that word power comes from the word we get our word dynamite. And I say we're living by the same dynamite. Dunamis. The power that Jesus had when He got up on, on the third day. That same power that got Him up is the same power that got us up. Got us out of sin. Brought us into the family of a, the living God. I want to look at just a couple of things in this uh, passage of Scripture and, uh, Rev- and uh, Exodus chapter number 12. And I say I appreciate the Lamb. The Lamb is seen in several ways in this passage. Chapter 12, verse number 3 says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man... A lamb. Can I say it's going to be in selection. Not only does he say a lamb, he says according to the house of their fathers, a, a lamb for a an house. And if the household be too little, verse 4, too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the Lamb. It is not only a Lamb in verse number 3, but he mentions not only a selection or a singular Lamb, but he also mentions in verse number 4, it is a specific Lamb. The Lamb. Well, we say any Lamb will do. No. There's only one that could do the job. Now there was probably a multitude of lambs uh, in uh, Bethlehem that was given over. Remember Bethlehem is the place where they raised the lambs just five miles away from Jerusalem. That's the reason those shepherds were on the watch that night. They were watching their flock by night. And the Lord gave them a revelation from heaven to show them, go in there, listen, go down into Bethlehem where the Lamb of God is going to be born. He's going to be prepared. And they would take that Lamb from Bethlehem, those lambs that were on the hillside, they would take them over to Jerusalem and sell them and, uh, so that they could be offered as sacrifices typifying the Passover. But could I say there was a specific Lamb, the Lamb of God, He's the only one that could do what was needful for you and I. Then not only is it specific, but it is not only that, it is a special lamb. Your lamb, in verse number 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. And I say it's a special lamb. Verse 5 also says it is a sinless lamb. It is without blemish. I don't want to get too far into this, but uh, when Jesus rode into Bethlehem, uh, rode into Jerusalem on the donkey on that great day's called Palm Sunday, and he rode into uh, Jerusalem, that was the day that the lambs, all the lambs, were set aside so that the priests could inspect them before they were to be offered. Same thing happened to Jesus. Read the story. We heard it last week in part that uh, that is when He was set aside and uh, the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they all inspected Him. They all asked Him questions. Could I say He passed the test with flying colors? Now, I never did like tests that much in school. I don't want to discourage young people by talking about school. (laughs) 
But uh, when, when they give us tests, I always cringed when they only had about three questions on it. Because, you know, the, my chances of making a good grade uh, sort of went out the door. If I didn't know one of those three, I, I made a failing grade. Don't take much for me. Listen, I was pretty good at math. Don't take much for me to figure I was in trouble. At least give me ten. I've got three I could miss and still be passing. Now, I'm not saying y'all do your dead level worst. Y'all to do your dead level best. But could I say the more questions, it seemed like I had a greater chance. And I like those multiple choice questions myself. <laughs> you know, I close my eyes. Don't you do that now. I had a professor, or not a professor, but I had a teacher in school. He, he called those uh, multiple guess. <laughs> Not multiple choice. But could I say, they only had, they only had about three uh, that questioned him and he passed them all. Made a 100 on it. That's what we like to see come to the house, right? But could I say, he was a special lamb. He was a sinless lamb. There was no sin found in him. They looked him over. Matter of fact, they tried to trip him up and trick him. But they couldn't trick him. He turned their own questions back on them. And they failed every test that he gave them. Then not only that, he was a strong lamb. He was to be of the, this lamb was to be of the first year. And not only was you see it as a lamb, I notice I see where it was placed. It was on the lentil. They put the blood on the lentil. If the place is seen, chapter 12 and verse number 7, and they shall take the, of the blood and strike it on the two doorposts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The place. It's not to be continued. It's to be shed. You know, shedding of blood is the only way you get remission of sin. And they had to shed the blood in the Old Testament portraying that Jesus would come and shed His blood. And by the shedding of His blood can we be saved. You'll not be saved without blood. The blood has to be applied. Now not a physical putting on of the blood. They did this to show forth what was going to take place in our spiritual life one day. The Lord would come by and we would receive what He had to say and the blood would be applied to us. The place is seen. It's not in the basin it's on the doorposts and the lintel. The lintel is the place across the top of the, of the door. And then the doorposts of the house. It was not to be placed on the threshold to be trampled underfoot and disgraced. It was to be put up in a high place. And I say not only do I notice a place, but there is a prominence of the blood. Look in verse number 13 of chapter 12. He says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And I notice the prominence of the blood. They were not to be ashamed of that blood. Where it could be seen, it had to be placed in a place where the death angel, when he come through, he would see that blood had been applied. I was reading a verse over in verse number 29 of this chapter. And this is how important it was because look what it says. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne under the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. In verse number 30, and, the, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Did you know the Lord, the reason He uses this analogy of the firstborn is because the first birth is rejected. 
You say, well, I'll get in on my own. I'll get in the way I want to. No, you won't. God is always, look at the types all the way through from Genesis all the way through. He has always rejected the first birth. He only receives the second birth. No wonder when He came to uh, Nicodemus on that fateful night in John chapter number 3, He told him, Nicodemus, it's not, it's not that you might have to be, but it's that you must be born again. So we got a lot of people saying, well, you just might have to be. It might be alright. That's what you think. Or that is not what I think. That ain't what God thinks is what, what matters, what God says. He said you must be born again. The prominence of the blood and then the power of the blood is seen in verse number 23 of this chapter. And he says, and they saw not... Uh, let me go back. I'm reading the one, wrong one. Verse number 23. And he says, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. Aren't, you. aren't you glad you've had Christ's blood applied to your spiritual life? Because when the destroyer comes, and he will, He'll require blood. And the blood has been applied to you and I that are saved. Then not only that, there is the putting on of the blood is through hyssop. Hyssop is a type of faith. It is a small, one of the smallest plants on God's earth. And as a result, it is something that would uh, be used to put on the doorpost and the lintel of that house. How do you get that blood applied? By faith. You trust Him. You look to Him. Listen, He didn't put it on the inside of the house. They put it on the outside of the house. And the firstborn may have been a little boy. Or a little girl. The firstborn may have been, uh, listen, may have been the dad. He may have been the firstborn in his family. Or the mom. Or the cattle in the, in the backyard. When he, when the, listen, when the death angel come through. He was going to take out the firstborn. That firstborn son may have looked up to dad and said, Dad, is the blood applied? He said, yes, it's been applied. You can trust fully in it. It's alright. And I say, when the blood has been applied, you can trust fully in it. It will do its job. Amen. Not only that, I notice the lamb, I notice the lentil, but when you come through this passage, you have to See the Lord. You have to see the Lamb. You have to see the lentil. But you also have to see the Lord. The Lord is the one who is the Creator. The Lamb, you see the condition. The lentil, you see the covering. But the Lord, you see the Creator. The one who is sufficient to do the job. He created and provided redemption for all of those. Every family, even in those in Egypt's land, those Egyptians could have had the blood applied to the doorposts and the lintel. But many of them didn't. There was a great cry. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about over in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were, but He does say about Egypt. There was a great cry that came out of Egypt that evening. Because when the death angel came through, some were not prepared. Some were not ready. Notice when they prepared that lamb in chapter number 12 and verse number 8. It says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. And he says, And eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire. His head with his legs and with the Pertinence thereof. The per word pertinence is a word we don't use in our day. It has to do with the heart, the innermost part. And he says in verse 10, And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 
And I say He's given us a, a glimpse of what the Lord is like. First of all, He shows us attitude. You know, we've disciplined our children because of attitude. And let me tell you this, if you hadn't, you missed it. Because a lot of things, you don't dis discipline them for action. You discipline them for a attitude. How they are responding. You've had it done. You've probably done it yourself. Puffed up. Got mad. Right? Well, his attitude's never been wrong. And now what it says in here, we're supposed to partake of him in such a special way. His, as he says in here as we read it, he says, uh, eat not at all uh, raw or sodden at all with water. He says, roast with fire. His head. His head with his legs and the pertinence thereof. Attitude. Deal with the attitude. We need to deal with our own attitude. True. We get all puffed up about stuff. We need to deal with our own attitude. We sometimes get crossways, don't we? I'll admit it. We all do. We get all crossed up about something that didn't go our way, and it's not every red light on Stone Drive don't always go my way. If I ain't careful, I get puffed up about it. <laughs> you try running one, see what happens. Don't do it. They got all those lights everywhere. They'll they'll snap your picture. Or could I say attitude? We're to have the mind of Christ. You say, what am I supposed to be thinking? Thinking like Jesus? Yeah. Would Jesus think like we think? Have the bitterness in our heart? Have the hatred for one another? Would we have a look down on somebody that didn't have what we have? Are you listening? Is that not true? What, what did Jesus do? He was a friend of sinners. He loved sinners. Now, He didn't sin. He didn't fall over in their category and do what they did. But could I say He did this? He reached out to sinners and sinners loved Him. Sinners saw Him. Sinners wanted to, uh, listen, they wanted to follow Him. And the, it was the Pharisees He had problems with. Could I say we need to have attitude? Uh, need to see Him in His attitude. Need to see in His, his affections, the pertinence thereof. His heart. We need to get a good glimpse of the heart of God. Of what, what God loves, we ought to love. Right? We ought to love what He loves. He loves everybody. We ought to love everybody. That doesn't mean we agree with everybody. But it does mean we ought to love everybody. We ought to love sinners. We ought to love saints. Is that not true? Then also, not only affections, we see actions. His legs. They're to eat, partake of that. Now I know I'm not too much on lamb chops, you know, but that's what they were eating. I guess they, they loved it. It was a delicacy, and it is even in our day. I mean, you should go try to buy some. It would cost you. But could I say that uh, our lamb is a whole lot different? We're thinking only of food. We need to think of Him. And we partake of Him. We Listen, we assimilate Him into our life. When you eat something, it becomes a part of you. There's an old saying about, and it's usually about dieting and all that, you know. We are what we eat. There's some truth to that. Physically. But there's greater truth to the spiritual. If we only eat of the world, we eat out of the listen, we eat out of the garbage cans of Egypt. What did Israel want after they got so murmuring and discouraging and uh, they didn't want to be over there in the wilderness and, and they murmured against Moses and against Aaron? And what did they want? They wanted to go back uh, and eat of the onions and garlics. You know what that was? That was garbage food. We like it pretty good in our day. It makes something taste pretty good, but that's what they threw out and they were wanting to go back to the onions and leeks and garlic. I don't know about you, but every one of those make you where people don't want to be around you. 
you eat a, now don't do this, don't try this, but if everybody in here had ate a big bait of garlic before they come to church tonight, wouldn't we have a time? <laughs> Who is that smells like that? It'd be us. Because we had all have done it. And they, they wanted to go back and eat at that. Listen, you are what you eat. And spiritually we are that way. If we eat out of the garbage cans of this world, we're not, we're not going to be too pleasant. But we're supposed to partake of Christ. Eat His book. Now get around Him. Let Him, uh, let us become more like Him by us assimilating Him into our life. And not only that, but when they got ready to go, it affected their actions because uh, they were to gird their loins is that not true? In verse number 11, he says, and when you eat it, I don't know this, you know, but uh, we like to sit down when we eat, unless we're in a hurry. But he was telling them, basically, uh, you need to be ready. I don't know if they got rid of all the chairs, packed the chairs up already, and they stood up and ate. That's what it says. He says, and thus shall you eat it with your loins gird. And then with the your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. You eat it fast, because it's time for them to leave out of Egypt. And I say we need to be ready, because our exit out of this world could be extremely fast. A whole lot faster than their exit. When they got out of Egypt, they went very fast. They got out by night, but could I say, we're getting out of here uh, when Jesus comes, and it's going to be in a twinkling of an eye. We're going to leave out of here. And I say the actions is seen that it needs to be affected with our loins. That's our power. Our shoes on our feet. That's our preparation. They're no longer, you know, uh, slaves in the Old Testament and even early New Testament, uh, when the uh, prodigal came back to the father's house, you know what he had? He had no shoes. Slaves in those days did not have shoes. Because I say they're no longer slaves. They had been slaves in Egypt's land under the domination of the Pharaohs. Because I say they were no longer to be slaves. They had been freed by Holy God. And you and I, as I said this morning about sin, we're no longer in bondage to sin. We've been broke, the chains have been broken loose so that we can serve Him with our whole heart. They put shoes on their feet and then a staff in their hand, they were to be pilgrims and strangers in the land. I see the actions. And then I see the acclamation. What they pronounce and say. The praise. Do you know that when they cooked the lamb, they were to cook it uh, and put, uh, they were to put bitter herbs in it. And when they ate it, and they even did that. You know, it was 1,400 years from this night in Exodus 12 before Jesus would come. 1,400 years. That meant that 1,400 times they were to celebrate the Passover. They didn't do it. There was a great bit of time when they didn't even observe the Passover. But they were supposed to do it every year for 1,400 years. And every year that they sat down at the table for their Passover meal and they ate of the lamb, it was to assimilate into their life so they'd have strength and be able to get up and do what they were supposed to do spiritually and physically. But also, it was given so that when they ate of the bitter herbs, they remembered Egypt. They remembered what they had went through. Do you know, when we have Christ in our life, we remember... Even today, when you heard about Calvary, did you not remember that it was our sins? Becky said it a while ago, it was our sins that put Him on the cross. All they could put on His label was who He was. They could also put on there, He was the Son of God. They didn't do that, but they could have. But the only reason He was put on the Calvary was because of our sins. He died. For me. J. 
chapter 12 and verse number 8. He says, They shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. And when they ate it, they would remember their sins. They would remember being part of being a slave and how Egypt had treated them. You know, I think this sometimes, that we as God's people being saved, that we don't, we don't really think back of how this world treated us when we were lost and how they're continuing to treat us. This world's not our home. If you're content in this world, there's something wrong. Now, I'm not saying you ought not be, uh, ought, to, ought to be satisfied to win people to Christ and all that, but could I say that this is not our home. Where you're living right now, you're not going to be living. We're going to leave it all behind. We're going to give it all over. Could I say, we're getting ready to get out of this place. Look at chapter number 12 and verse 42. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed for of all the children of Israel in their generations. We've been brought out so that we could be brought in. The Lord took them out of Egypt so He could bring them into the wilderness. He let them travel in the wilderness so He could bring them out, 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 of, out of the wilderness into the promised land. And I say, this world's not our home. We're just traveling through. And we need to remember not only our sins when we eat and partake of Christ through the Word of God. We're to remember who we were. Now don't dwell on it because that might discourage you, but we're to remember that we were not always Christians and we were not always living for God and we're not always good people. We were wicked. We were ungodly. And He brought us out. That's what we do when we partake of Christ. We remember Him. He gives us strength, but He also gives us understanding and revelation of who we were and then who we are now and who we need to be even a little better. He died for us. In the battle of Chickamauga, uh, a man was putting flowers on the grave. And as he was doing it, a man came up to the tombstone and asked him what he was doing. He said, he died for me. Now that man was still buried. He may have been in heaven, which had been a blessing. But could I say, He died for me. Put flowers on His... You don't have to put it on His tomb because He's gone. But you ought to give Him flowers. You ought to thank Him. You ought to praise Him. See, the Passover was a joyous time too. They were 